Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, our text for this fifth Sunday after Epiphany is from our Gospel reading, Mark chapter 1, verse 38. But he, Jesus, said to them, Let us go into the next towns that I may preach there also, because for this purpose I have come forth. Here ends our text. Jesus came for a singular purpose. He descended from heaven with but one purpose, to save all mankind by his suffering, his death, and his resurrection. He was laser-focused, driven, committed to this singular purpose, and then also the preaching and the sharing, proclaiming of it from city to city. He needed to go to the next city and to the next. He needed to come to us with that same eternal word this day of the good news of his salvation. He had to tell sinners, he had to tell us, that the kingdom of heaven is near. The Messiah, he himself, has come. Oh, Jesus would not be deterred in his mission. We'll begin the Lenten season in, in 10 days on the 17th of February, remembering how we have failed in our mission to love our God with all our heart, soul, and mind, and our neighbor as ourselves. The ashes that will be placed on our foreheads on Ash Wednesday our stark reminder of our failure to keep God's law in our sinful mortality. But the ashes placed in the sign of the cross remind us of our baptism, that we are connected to Jesus' victory and to Jesus, Jesus' salvation that he has won for all mankind on the cross. We are connected with his death and his resurrection through our baptisms. For there was one only who could complete this mission, Jesus himself. And with purpose, he carried our sins. He carried our shame. He carried our debt and paid for it all by the precious blood shed for us on the cross. Jesus' purpose, driven life, saves our aimless, sinful lives. Yes, we'll begin the Lenten season in 10 days hearing how Jesus was driven by the Holy Spirit after his baptism into the desert and was tempted by the devil for 40 days and 40 nights. His purpose was to succeed for all of us who have fallen to temptation. Jesus forced his body to fast that entire time to combat the evil that was trying to distract him from completing his mission. Pastor Getz will be leading a midweek Lenten series called, Were You There When? It will remind us often of Jesus' passion, of how he, he was there to suffer and to and to succeed where we have fallen away. He came to save us in our weakness. You know, today, the pinnacle of sports competition will take place to determine who is the most driven, the most focused, and able to win. Athletes have prepared for today's Super Bowl with extreme strength training and dieting, and we're fascinated how purposeful people can be to win a perishable crown. The quarterback for one team, Tom Brady, pushes himself at the age of 43 when most other players are, have already retired in their 30s. Sports lore has titled An Amazing Comeback that was led by John Elway in 1987 called The Drive. The Drive. In 1987, the AFC Championship game between the Denver Broncos and the Cleveland Browns was held and John Elway led his team to an overtime victory with a drive-tying touchdown with just 37 seconds left in the game. Maybe we'll be treated to something as, as, as similar today as we watch the Super Bowl, as we eat our brats and, and, and drink our beer. Yet Paul recognizes that these, these competitions, these sporting competitions, only win a perishable crown. In 1 Corinthians 9.25, he says, everyone who competes for the prize is tempered in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we an imperishable crown. But we an imperishable crown. Paul continues in the next verse to remind us what our Christian purpose is and the prize in life that must not be lost. Therefore, I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become 
disqualified. Ah, not everyone wins the imperishable crown. There are those who will be disqualified. Yes, there will only be one team that will hoist the Vince Lombardi trophy today and, and pass it around for all to kiss. Well, we'll see how that works out with, with the COVID-19 situation. But for those losers of the perishable crown, there's always next year, if there is a next year, to try to win again. But for those who are disqualified from winning the imperishable wreath, the imperishable crown of eternal victory in heaven, life does not go on, at least not in heaven, but only in hell. Paul continues in the very next chapter, 1 Corinthians 10, to remind us of what happened to the losers who spent 40 years wandering aimlessly in the desert. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be aware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea as they fled from the Egyptians, all were baptized in, into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. If you watch the Super Bowl, you'll probably see a, a few commercials today telling you that you can have a life that is more purposeful. There might be a few truck commercials by the company claiming to have the better truck. Drive a Ford, a Chevy, or a Ram. Make your life more purposeful. And Ford has even set up a scholarship program for youth called Driving Dreams. It aims to help youth be purposeful for those who want to go on to college. What drives your life? What has driven your life? What still motivates you and gives purpose and meaning to it? For some, the, the goal in life is to be the best at your profession, be it a doctor or a nurse or a teacher or a farmer, a musician, a parent, a husband, a wife. For most per people, the purpose in life is to work hard so that one can retire at a certain age. But what next? Paul poses this question in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins, then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If, this, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men, the most pitiable. If this life is all there is, work hard, retire, and that's it, Paul says. That's the most pitiable. But we are gathered here today in God's house because we know that life goes on beyond retirement. There is a resurrection. And like Paul, we don't want to be disqualified from it. We gather here today to drink the same spiritual drink of the rock that leads and follows, follows us, and that rock is Jesus Christ. We gather to receive specially this morning His very body and His blood for our forgiveness. So Paul exclaims, yes, there is a resurrection. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. A life which is driven without Christ is a life of vanity. It has no purpose, but it's driven by the wind and whatever popular thinking of the day is being preached. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What profit has a man from all his labor in which he toils under the sun? One generation passes away and another generation comes. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of things that are, come, are to come by those who will come after. Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Yes, we try hard to preserve legacies in this world. There will be an induction into the Super Bowl Hall of Fame for Peyton Manning this, this year. There are many lifetime achievement awards in many different professions, many halls of fames. And yet we hear in our Old Testament reading from Isaiah chapter 40, even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young shall utterly fail, and they shall fall. A favorite actor of mine, Christopher Plummer, entered his rest today at age 91. 
He was well known for his role as Captain Van Trapp on The Sound of Music. In the movie, he was driven to discipline his children in the best way possible, being, being a soldier himself. He wanted them to be more purposeful and disciplined. He even had a whistle sound for each of them to call them. Yet as the movie progressed, you remember how he learned that being a good father wasn't just about disciplining his children, but expressing his care for them. God, our Heavenly Father, indeed disciplines us out of love for us, but he also lifts us up, cares for us. He lifts us up who are weary and unable to finish the race unless we be disqualified, God tells us. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. And this is only possible because Jesus came from heaven and ran the perfect race for us, offered himself as a perfect sacrifice on the cross. Psalm 40 tells us the very words of Jesus that, that he spoke to his father. He also quoted in Hebrews chapter 10, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire. My, my ears you have opened. Burnt offering and sin offering you did not require. Then I said, Behold, I come. In the scroll of the book is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God, and your law is within my heart. Yes, Jesus has come, descended from heaven, to do his Father's will for us. Jesus became the sacrifice to end all sacrificing by offering himself on the altar of the cross. This was the Super Bowl of Super Bowls. This was the victory of victories for all who wait on the Lord in faith. His victory becomes your victory. You run stronger than any football player who takes the field this afternoon, for you run in Christ who strengthens you. Philippians 4.13 Jesus' singular purpose becomes your singular purpose through baptism. You are united to his death and his resurrection and led by the Holy Spirit to remain faithful unto death and receive the crown of life. Revelation 2.10 Your purpose in life, therefore, is twofold. To preach Christ crucified and not to be disqualified after you've proclaimed the good news to others. It's our great joy to hear Dale Mooring also this day profess his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, make his profession of faith before us and before God in this congregation, that he trusts in the Lord and pledges to continue the good fight with all of us until God calls us home and gives us the imperishable crown. For this purpose, we have been called through the living word of God. And thanks be to God for Jesus Christ completing the Father's will perfectly for us. His purpose-driven life of love for us that went all the way to the cross to his death and his resurrection has gained for us the victory. So Psalm 40 speaks the very words of Jesus of how his message of salvation has purposely reached us this day. I have proclaimed the good news of righteousness in the great assembly, indeed, I do not restrain my lips. O Lord, you yourself know, I have not hidden your righteousness within my heart. I have declared your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your loving kindness and your truth from the great assembly. From city to city, his word comes to us this morning and to all of you who are listening. Amen. And the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, Guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.